Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Sabita Power. I'm a professor in the Department of, <coughs> excuse me, Microbiology and Immunology and director of the Miami CIFAR. It is my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Alan Lande to give today's uh, CIFAR virtual seminar. I've been following Alan's science uh, throughout his career as we hold many common interests, but it may also have something to do because of a scientific bond stemming from our mentors. I trained with the late Dr. Robert Good, who trained Dr. Max Cooper, who is currently at Emory, and Max Cooper trained Alan. So that makes me Alan's scientific aunt of sorts. <laughs> So right after his postdoctoral post training under Dr. Max Cooper when he was in Birmingham, Alan joined the faculty at Rush University Medical Center in 1983 and rapidly rose through the ranks to become the Coogan Professor and Chairman Department of Immunology and Microbiology. Alan helped establish the HIV research program at Rush which has grown to encompass uh, both a basic and translational focus on immune studies in HIV. Over the last 30 plus years, he has had an illustrious career, having held and currently holding several leadership positions at Rush, such as assistant provost for team science and vice chair of research at the in the Department of Internal Medicine. And no surprise, he's coordinating the COVID research at Rush now. So Dr. Lande is well known to the scientific community involved in HIV research. He performed some of the first immune evaluations of HIV infected hemophiliacs in 1982. His research has spanned the entire lifespan from infancy to aging and is currently focused on timely HIV topics in immune pathogenesis inflammation and uh, mucosal immunity, immune-based therapies, and the microbiome. I admire Alan for his mentorship skills, his ability to skillfully organize and lead conferences, and his unique relationship with numerous organizations, including the NIH. He's been a driving force in the Women's Interagency HIV Study Group, the WISE, <clears throat> and the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, known as the ACTG, where he has been working as a leading scientist in immunology since the beginning of the ACTG almost. Dr. Lande has published over 400 peer-reviewed papers, and he has written several invited reviews and book chapters. He is the recipient of many awards and grants from industry, the NIH, and other organizations. Uh, today, the title of his talk is HIV, Aging, and Inflammation, a Dangerous Trio. And this is especially relevant today as COVID-19 has highlighted the vulnerability of the aging population. So welcome, Alan, to University of Miami. Thank you, Savita. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Thank you so much, and it's really a great pleasure to be here in Miami virtually today um, as I'm giving this talk, and it is highly relevant. Uh, as Savita said, I've spanned a lot of different areas as an immunologist by training, but now working in the geriatrics and gerontology field. So it's especially fitting as I'm thinking about COVID-19 pandemic is how it really is disproportionately affecting our older populations and also thinking about the intersection of HIV and COVID is an important area that we need to focus on. And I think many of the topics I cover today will be especially relevant as we're thinking about them. When we're thinking about aging in our, in our context of, of, of the world, and we're now moving into new fields that some of you may or may not be familiar with from the National Institutes of Aging, the field of geroscience um, is one where we now can consider uh, not just lifespan or longevity, but consider health span. And here on this slide, you can see on the right, the different components of health span, including related to cognitive, um, the uh, cardiovascular, metabolic, 
uh, and body composition and neuromuscular. So all of these aspects of aging directly intersect with our thinking and it's also inflammaging with what we think about in HIV. Uh, these are important domains and there's a new field, as, as I said, of geroscience. Uh, Felipe Sierra, who helped found that uh, area at the NIH and a group just recently in the last month, retired from the NIH and NIA, although he'll keep his effort going. And this is a tremendous impact of how geroscience has taught us a lot about the biology of aging and how we can apply it both in aging and in HIV. As you can see, the domains that we cover are those that are very much important to our HIV population. And what we're now doing is shifting a delay towards compressing the period of lifespan with frailty and disability to now extend it and improve what is health span. So we wanna live longer, but live healthier, not just living longer. And that's the critical part of where the intersection of HIV and aging are. We also know that in geroscience, in the field that's coming from NIA, are the seven pillars of aging. And these are areas that we're especially interested in, in terms of uh, areas like proteostasis, adaption to stress, as we've just talked about, inflammation and inflammation, which I'll cover a lot of today. Um, we're also starting to look more at epigenetics uh, and especially metabolism, which I'll also speak towards. And then finally, stem cells and regeneration is important in the context of aging and, and reproducing aspects of aging. Um, there's also the fact that today aging is thought to be modifiable due to recognition of these pillars and aspects that we can seem to drive. So we can think about thinking about novel therapeutics in our aging field and addressing these, fine, these various drivers will have an impact on the multiple chronic conditions I've just elaborated in aging. So as we're starting to think about aging, what is that important intersection in immunosenescence in HIV and aging? Uh, and what are those particular drivers? Um, this was a, a review, an older review, but I think many of the points here are important from Judy Aberg, some of you know from New York, um, from Mount Sinai Hospital. And what we do know are the important roles of the pro-inflammatory cytokines and the pro-inflammatory signatures, IL-6, TNF-alpha, CRP and IL-1. And if I were going to give this talk on COVID-19, these would be the same important pro-inflammatory cytokines that are critical in the cytokine storm and outcomes we see in our COVID-19 patients. So as you think about it, there's an important intersection here between aging and COVID-19 that can especially affect our older uh, individuals who get COVID-19 also within the, the HIV field. We also know there's an important role for Procoagulants, and now again, D-dimer, a molecule that came up early on in the SMART studies as an important outcome measure of mortality and morbidity, is also critical in COVID-19. We're also interested in the monocyte activation uh, and markers such as soluble CD14 and the hemoglobin scavenger receptor. We're also aware of increases of the adaptive immune system, of T cell activation and immune senescence especially among CD8 cells. And much of that we think is uh, driven by, um, by our um, co-infecting uh, cytomegalovirus and the increased prevalence of that in aging. But we're also, in all of our aging studies in the future, going to have to take into account whether our patients have been infected with COVID-19. And as a matter of fact, I've just submitted a grant this week looking at the role of co-infections in COVID-19 in populations in Brazil in HIV aging population. So I think we can't, uh, we really have to include this in all of our paradigm shifts now of how COVID is affecting aging and outcomes in our HIV populations as well. And then finally, we're looking at shared outcomes in aging, HIV related to dementia, uh, cyto, uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke, frailty, and sarcopenia. Many of these are studied by many of the folks here listening today. So as Savita said, I've had a long-standing interest in many areas related to aging and the intersection of various topics, one of which has been the host microbiome. And I've been involved in running a microbiome and aging meeting over the last five years at NIH. And as a matter of fact, I just saw this morning our last summary of our fourth uh, uh, installment of the microbiome meeting was just published in AIDS and human retroviruses. And the fifth one is coming along as well. 
when we think about the gut microbiota, we have to think about this is a large, functionally stable community of bacteria. We're basically more microbial cells than we are host cells. Ratios of 10 to 1 have been used, but they may be lesser or, or, or so around that number. But again, we have a huge number of microbiota living in, in, in each of us. That not only includes bacteria, but that includes viruses and fungi, although I won't talk much about those. Those are critical components with regard to outcomes of aging and HIV. We also know there's an important role in nutrient metabolism and barrier function. It's really the microbiome, especially those in the uh, colon that are important in maintaining uh, gut barrier integrity through the production of short chain fatty acids, including butyrate, propionate, and acetate. These are critical molecules made by the host microbiome that help maintain gut barrier integrity. And when you lose those particular bacteria, then you end up losing the ability to maintain the gut barrier and then leads to a leaky gut. When we start thinking then in this next slide, looking at the interactions, there's a critical role of aging, inflammation, and gut dysbiosis. So as we all age, we know that we're having changes in our gut microbiome, some of it linked to our, our diets, others related to our health status, exercise, and so on. So again, it's all critical for us to get up every morning and do our exercise. And I'm sure those of you in Miami have the opportunity to go outside and walk in the beautiful sunshine. As I said here in Chicago, it's still freezing weather and most of our parks are still closed. But when we think about aging and inflammation, it's the same impact on the same organ system, such as neurologic impact, cardiometabolic, um, cancers, digestive. So all of these are critical intersections of how gut dysbiosis can also drive and be similar drivers to aging and inflammation. And what we saw early on in some studies we published almost eight years ago in collaboration with colleagues in uh, Melbourne, Australia, was to show that microbial translocation expands um, in the elderly and that we have Again, chronic endotoxemia here in the elderly, these are, these are individuals, healthy individuals over 70, young in 30. So that during, during the normal aging process, you do develop a leaky gut. And again, you can measure this by plasma LPS levels. When we then think about the gut microbiome though in aging, we see a lot of a variety of changes that seem to be very common across many studies. We get uh, inter-individual inter variability, but decreased biodiversity. And it's really the diversity of the gut microbiome that leads to a healthy gut and maintaining gut barrier integrity. It's interestingly, in other microbiome settings like that in the female genital tract, it's the, the monotony of that. It's, it's a, a, a single bacterial lactobacillus that's present. And when it becomes more diverse, that's leading to disease in the uh, microbiome of the gut. So again, different microbiome settings are different across different parts of the host. There's also uh, increased abundance of the gram-negative anaerobes with pathogenic potential. And so there's certain good bacteria can turn bad, uh, especially those of Prevotella. Prevotella are a common uh, host commensal present, especially in individuals who are vegetarians. But in the context of disease and age and aging and in HIV, they then take on a potential driving inflammation and they become what we now know as pathobiomes. We also know there's a, a decrease in firmicutes and a, uh, those related to the firmicutes, firmicutes and bacteroidetes. And also, as I mentioned earlier, a decrease in short chain fatty acid producing bacteria in the stool. So all this together, really is the driver of what happens during aging. Now, when we think about that with regard to HIV, we see very similar changes and we've published a number of papers over the last five years, many of them in collaboration with Carol Wilson and Steph Dillon's group in Colorado. Uh, but what we've shown, and these are very common features across many of the HIV studies, is that we see an increase, as I said, in the gram-negative bacteria, uh, such as the uh, proteobacteria, and Prevotella, and a decrease in bacteria with anti-inflammatory properties, those that make the short chain fatty acids. And so it's really this imbalance that occurs both in HIV and aging 
that leads to a loss of gut barrier integrity uh, and also leads to reduction of the short chain fatty acids that help maintain that gut barrier integrity and um, the, um, the actual uh, production of the, of the various LPS, LPB, and molecules in the periphery. If we then look overall, what we can find in summary for what happens in microbiome is that HIV and AIDS are independently associated with distinct changes in fecal microbiome. And a lot of the studies today are done using the fecal microbiome, although in many of our early studies, we had the opportunity to actually biopsy the, the gut tissue and get, to, get a look at the colon and the, um, and the uh, ileum. So had a look at both the large and small intestine and do find differences across different uh, parts of the GI tract. I might also add, there's now even an interest in the fecal microbiome in COVID-19. The actual gut may be an important reservoir for the virus because one of the highest levels of the ACE2 expression, which is the co-receptor for the spike protein of COVID-19, are the gut cells. And there was just a recent paper in Science last week from, from Hans Klaver's lab uh, in Utrecht in the Netherlands showing the ability to infect uh, cells of the GI tract and using organoid cultures, which he originally developed to study the impact of COVID-19 in gut tissue. So again, a very important intersection between HIV, aging, and COVID-19 is the study of the microbiome and how it affects uh, outcomes. We also know that HIV infection impacts age-related changes over time, and it's associated with increases of soluble markers of inflammation and monocyte activation, especially those of soluble 14 and 163. We also know there's an association between short chain fatty acids and dietary factors. Although these things are known in the pathogenic consequences, we have yet been able to find good interventional strategies to try to restore back this balance, especially in our aging HIV population. We've done a number of studies with dietary interventions, uh, with pre and probiotics and really have not found a good solution yet. So this is still a big area of investigation and might be an important area also for future studies as we look at what happens in our COVID-19 um, individuals. So when we're thinking about the microbiome, we're also thinking about another part of this and that's called the human glycome. And we're now being able to study this further with collaborators at Wistar Mohammed Abdul Monson's group and we found some interesting changes in the host glyco glycome that also relates to the microbiome that we think may have some opportunities for interventional strategies. So to just review for you, the glycome, which are these glycosylated molecules, are present as a circulating glycome and on cell surfaces, especially on epithelial cells and on immune cells. And these glycome structures that are present on circulating immunoglobulin molecules dictate the function of those molecules so that by changing the glycome structure, you can change things like antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity or uh, other functions like antibody uh, ADCP as well. So that a lot of the molecules that we're studying now, not only in HIV and aging, we're now beginning to look at these same glyc glycomic structures in the anti-COVID antibodies as well. And we've just submitted a uh, grant supplement with Muhammad to look at this in our COVID-19 patients. What we can find is that in HIV infection, it's associated with a persistent alteration in the IgG glycome. And in this case, we can look at the different glycan structures and find this is related to sialation. So when you have a hypocyalated uh, glycan, as you can see here on the right part of the slide, we find uh, that that increases in ART positives and then viremics. We also note then we can find actual active plasma sialidase in, even in our HIV positive ART uh, patients on ART who have suppressed virus with good CD4 responses. So this is what's happening to the antibody molecules as we measure these, uh, that they're losing sialic acid molecules and as I'll point out later, reducing their immune function. So what our hypothesis was for these initial studies is that HIV infection causes glycomic dysregulation that persists 
and may contribute to the HIV-associated inflammation and HIV persistent that is also found during aging. So this is a, uh, a, a study that was done, uh, a literature study that says that hyposylation is a marker of aging. So here's a new and interestingly new biomarker that glycans are novel biomarkers of chronologic and biologic aging uh, as well. And so they can be studied effectively by doing uh, just basic platform work on serum uh, sialic acid levels. We also have looked at the finding that levels of sialylated anti-inflammatory glycans are associated with aging during ART-suppressed infection. So again, looking at the number of uh, sialylated uh, glycans in terms of the total IgG glycome, that that goes down over normal aging. And this is, again, this is an HIV population, but we've also reproduced this in non-HIV population. So you lose sialic acid molecules on your IgG as you age, both in HIV and aging, and this then causes functional deficits in our antibody repertoire. We've then gone on to actually look at this further than just looking at the soluble glycome, but now to look at the gut glycome. And this is again an area which regulates homeostasis between the gut and the microbiome. So here we're now able to look at this important relationship between how the microbiome can be regulated by glycosylation. Uh, what are, there are key glycan differences in sialation and fucosylation between normal and age-associated gut. So in the normal gut, you have sialic acids attached to glycans and high fucosylation, and that the sialic acid catabolism can alter the gut composition and leads to microbial dysbiosis. So over time, when you change this uh, outcome, you then lead to these alterations in gut inflammation. On the right-hand side, you'll see what's happened to the fucose molecules. So lack of proper gut fucosylation can alter the gut microbial composition, again, from published uh, papers in, in Nature and Science, leading to microbial dysbiosis. So what we're now finding is that the whole of the gut microbiome alterations may be importantly linked to these whole glycome uh, interactions. Our first study that was just published uh, just a month ago in mucosal immunology looked at patients that we had already obtained at Rush. So these were HIV positive patients who were on uh, ARVs, virologically suppressed to uh, viral load below 20. We also, uh, these were all patients with over 500 CD4 counts. And we, as I said, in our original study, were able to get tissue samples at both the uh, right colon, the left colon, and the ileum. So we had three biopsy sites. And from that, we were able to go in, and do uh, looks at microbial uh, sequencing, and then also did on these same biopsies, glycomic profiling and HIV DNA quantitation and uh, targeted qPCR for cytokine and chemokine. So I'll just show you some of the results here. And we show directly that the gly gut glycome, including sialic acid, correlated in this study with soluble CD163 level. So that in what happens in the gut does not stay in the gut. So when we looked at hyposylation of the gut, we found that that was highly significantly correlated with increasing levels of plasma uh, CD163. When we looked then at the other side at the number of sialylated glycans, that there was an inverse correlation uh, as well as with the fucosylated glycones, glycans. So again, the changes in the gut glycome correlated directly and highly significantly then with the levels of soluble 163 in the periphery, linking that to, as we know, monocyte directed activation and potential outcomes. We then looked further at the compartmentalization and did see differences. So when we look at ileum versus right colon and which is sigmoid colon, we're able to see clear differences in the, the levels. So if you look here at the fucose levels are higher in the ileum as compared to the sigmoid colon and sialic acid levels are highest in the sigmoid colon. So again, across the different aspects of the uh, regional differences in terms of the actual glycosylation, which can also lead to important functions. We then went ahead and did a quantitative lectin microarray that validated what we saw 
by the, uh, in the previous slide here, by immunohistochemistry, finding then that the actual levels of, uh, in the lilium, ilium were the highest in terms of the fucosylation. And here you can see the level of the lectin microarray to the immunohistochemistry were highly correlated to each other. So we can confirm at the protein level versus the microarray, the levels of expression. We've then gone ahead and done mucosal RNA-seq uh, on these various tissues. And what we found, interestingly enough, was a connection between gut hyposylation and the activation of an inflammasome mediator, ELF2 signaling. And as you can see in this previous publication, ELF2 regulates pro-inflammatory cytokine expression. And now we're linking then the changes in these uh, hyposylation to the inflammasome. And what we found is that there was a positive correlation with, in the ileum of HIV DNA and inflammation that positively correlates here and that gut inflammation and inflammasome-mediated signaling was elevated. And so we find this level of ELF2 being highly significant by the RNA-seq analysis with loss of the fucose pathways. We've also gone on and the, done the same analysis here, uh, looking at uh, the HIV DNA and inflammation negatively correlated with the ileum uh, fucosylation as well. So we're finding now links between the inflammasome mediated outcomes um, and the sialic acid expression. So we think these are important potential targets now for us to go after. And we actually now have a, a grant in R01 that we've just begun funding on to actually look at the interventional strategies in primate models. So we're now going to actually try to restore back both the sialic acid levels and the fucose levels in our uh, animal models of non-human primates and see how those then ultimately affect the outcomes of gut inflammation and gut barrier integrity. And you can see here then that HIV has significant effects in that regard. So as I pointed out, the gut microbiome is a critical feature uh, in aging, in HIV, and also in driving, as I brought up earlier, in non-communicable diseases. So we've then begun to link this further in terms of the more critical metabolic outcome pathways. And one of these pathways that we've studied a lot of is in tryptophan catabolism. Just to remind you that uh, tryptophan can be catabolized through various enzyma enzymatic pathways. And one of the enzymes in dolamine 2,3-dioxygenase, which is turned on during inflammatory pathways and in HIV, will drive a more pro-inflammatory pathway. And we can begin to study this by looking at ratios of kynurenin to tryptophan and linking those then back to comorbid outcomes. We're also interested, as others are, I know, on this call in terms of the end products of this pathway, especially nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD, in terms of their role in host aging and outcomes, especially related to muscle and bone and mitochondrial function. And then just to remind you here that IDO activity also correlates with loss of gut barrier promoting TH17 cells in, H in SIV and in HIV, and that you lose the gut resident lactobacillus that correlates with an increase in IDO activity. Interestingly enough, one of the main drivers for IDO activity has been interferon gamma, which we know is elevated significantly in many of our HIV patients. And it is then that pathway and that chronic production of this inflammatory gamma interferon that appears to drive IDO production, which in a normal host is mainly IDO and TDO made in the liver that are now made across all different cells and organs in the body. So you get this massive IDO activity across many parts of the host, including in the uh, central nervous system. And there's a tremendous amount of studies as well looking at IDO activity in the CNS and we've collaborated with Bruce Bruce Group in uh, Sydney, Australia on some of those studies on the CNS as well. So just to bring it back to our linking then the plasma metabolites and outcomes related to changes, here we're looking at the plasma tryptophan metabolites and we've shown in this previous study in the WISE cohort, and this actually includes both WISE and MAX, this is a study of almost uh, 3,000 persons where we looked at plasma tryptophan and it correlated with independently associated with risk so that there's a protective effect 
of tryptophan, but the kynurenic acid or the kynurenic to tryptophan ratio has an increased risk, risk then of, of CVD that's independent of standard uh, risks when we adjust for inflammation, immune activation, and other common CVD risk factors such as body composition or smoking. So that these are critical metabolic products that are elevated during HIV and aging that can then be used to predict the outcomes uh, related to these comorbid conditions. We also showed in these early studies the link between soluble CD14 uh, and uh, CD4 T cell activation and the kynurin and the tryptophan ratio. So that these were, again, markers that we know are correlated with a systemic activation that can be then linked to these changes in the tryptophan pathway. So what we were able to initially find is that tryptophan catabolism and the related metabolites are altered in HIV and associated with progression of carotid artery atherosclerosis. Uh, we've published at least five other papers on a variety of other metabolites in the WISE and MAX cohorts that are linked, again, with outcomes of alterations in the gut microbiome and then the systemic metabolites. And we think now these may provide us important new targets to go after in terms of modifying the host outcome measures in, in further development. We're also interested not only in these pathways, but also in immune cell metabolic reprogramming and inflammation and comorbidities, especially as those that are related to, as you can see here, adipose tissue uh, and other pathways in the oxidative phosphorylative and um, glycolytic pathways. And I know some of you are familiar with Clovis Palmer's work, and this is some of the, a summary of some of those studies that we've done collaboratively with Clovis, um, who's now in Philadelphia, uh, and originally, in, and we did these studies when he was in Melbourne, Australia. And what we can now find is that HIV actually drives a metabolic exhaustion of our CD4 T cells, uh, and that this is characterized now by this, in this pathway on the right, showing that when you drive CD4 through, from an oxidative phosphorylative to a glycolytic state, you now drive these to immune exhaustion cells. And we now find in our HIV patients that the CD5728 negative cells are elevated and they also express GLUT1 and they express the exhaustion marker PD1. So this happens in HIV that this drives this immune exhaustion and glycolytic pathway that leads to higher levels of inflammation. We also note, interestingly enough, that this pathway is driven through PI3 kinase uh, and through the AKT and mTORC pathway. So this is important because we're thinking, as I'll come back to at the end, a number of molecules that can actually block the mTOR pathway, namely rapamycin. And as you know, one of the major pathways that's being looked at in the field of aging are these mTOR or rapalogs that have been used. And interestingly enough, there was recently a, a webinar from uh, AFARA on this concept of using rapalogs now as a way of treating the older individuals with COVID-19. So I think, again, a very important intersection between aging, potentially HIV, and COVID-19 in targeting now the mTORC pathway, which would bring down this level of, of uh, GLUT1 and glycolytic pathways. There is actually data, and it was published recently, that says in COVID, you also get this higher glycolytic state driven for your T cells that drive their inflammation. So again, the triple threat of HIV, aging, and COVID driving very similar pathways, which we're now trying to dissect further. And what we then went on in studies with Clovis is to do is to look at the genetic variants or SNPs in these metabolic genes that are associated with CD4 T cell recovery on heart. And we published this paper as well about a year ago, showing that there are different SNPs, the, um, the GG, GA, and AA SNP, so that the level of GLUT1 expression is highest on CD4 cells in those individuals with uh, the GG, and that also leads to a higher level of immune non-responder status in those individuals with that particular uh, SNP. So again, the presence of these glycolytic pathways are also critical in driving the uh, lack of CD4 responsiveness in some of our patients who are on suppressive heart as well. So that again, has important functional outcomes. 
We've then gone on in collaboration with colleagues actually at the University of West Indies in Jamaica to look at immunometabolisms in association with diabetes in persons living with HIV. And in this case, we've used another approach to look at the glycolytic and oxidative phosphorylation pathways using uh, seahorse analyzers. So this is a, an approach that allows you to measure oxygen consumption rate or OCR or the oxidative phosphorylative and the extracellular acidification or ECAR, which is a measure of your glycolytic rate. And you can do this now on the single cell level. We've then shown then in this uh, study of looking at patients in red here are the patients on, with diabetes or diabetic treatment or no diabetes. So now we're looking at their ECAR, which is their acidification rate and elevated glycolytic activity that we find this both in HIV positive patients with diabetes and even those that are treated for their diabetes, they do have a higher glycolyt glycolytic rate. So that again, that there may be other consequences even in our HIV patients of the comorbid conditions that can drive some of these outcomes. And then we also know as an underlying condition to driving susceptibility to COVID, diabetes is one of those conditions. Now we haven't gone back and studied our COVID patients yet by seahorse analysis, but it is something that is planned for future experiments. We've then gone on to do some uh, microfluidic RT-PCR using the Fluidime Biomark system as well uh, with these same uh, purified CD4 samples. And what we can find here as well is that the CD4 T cells from HIV infected women with diabetes have an increased expression of all the metabolic genes from the glycolytic TCA and pentose fast uh, pentose phosphate pathway. So again, at the functional level and at the gene level, we are finding alterations and that we think these are critical in terms of important targets for future therapy. So in my uh, last timing I have here, I really wanna focus on targeted therapies because I think that's where we all wanna go. And this is the, uh, the tree, the very famous tree that many of you have seen. And we actually published this tree in our review um, on, uh, on various outcomes and biomarkers that Amy Justice was the author of. And you'll remember this is Peter Hunt uh, was, the, uh, was the person who actually first came up with the tree analogy. And this, came, this is a JID paper from 2018 that uh, all of us were co-authors on. So now we have to remember is the root drivers of the outcomes and here, you know, in aging and HIV, we think about CMV, we think about microbial translocation. Uh, we can also start thinking about COVID-19 as another root driver, because if we look at the branches of inflammation, coagulation, and maybe even fibrosis, although I've not seen that data, we can also add in the idea that COVID can drive those outcomes. And if we look at the various um, approaches here that are being looked at therapeutically, now all of this was done and this talk was put together well ahead of COVID. But almost every one of these, out, uh, one of these uh, therapeutic approaches are being used in COVID. IL-1 beta, we're starting, again, you know there are studies in HIV and aging for IL-1 beta. We're starting in the ACTG, a trial with canakinumab uh, in collaboration with Novartis, JAK stat inhibitors. We're starting a trial in COVID-19 with ruxolitinib, uh, which has also been used in HIV. IDO inhibitors, although the problem with IDO inhibitors, we just don't have good uh, drugs to use in that pathway. And that's really an important area for thinking about for further development. Metformin, I'll talk to you a bit about the HIV metformin work that Jean-Pierre Routy has been working on that we're now collaborating. But that's also being proposed in aging studies, as you know, in the TAME trial, and also for COVID-19 therapeutics. And then finally, rapamycin will be another opportunity to think about. So we've been also thinking about age-related metabolic dysfunction. And I brought this up earlier in terms of the tryptophan pathway, where we found that in aging is characterized by the development of, again, metabolic dysfunction and frailty, the same features we see in HIV. And again, levels of NAD and its precursors that decline during chronologic aging causing mitochondrial dysfunction and metabolic abnormality. So again, NAD may be a critical feature for this. The NAD decline is implicated in the development of age-related muscle dysfunction, glucose intolerance, 
and stem cell senescence. And again, a lot of this work, I know Monty Montano's on and maybe he can comment later during the question and answer. He's done a lot of elegant work uh, in this area in his lab in Boston. One of the interesting features though that comes back again in, in an area that I started working on almost 30 years ago is CD38. A marker some of you may remember from Janice Georgie's work in the MAX cohort in the late 80s and early 90s. CD38 was the best predictive marker for clinical outcomes well before we had heart or therapy in our early patients with HIV. Well, now we're rediscovering CD38 again in the aging and HIV field, not because it's a marker of activation, but because of its critical enzymatic activity as an NADase. And it's one of the main enzymes that are responsible for the age-related NAD decline in mammals. So it gives us now a whole new uh, respect for thinking about CD38 and thinking about it again in aging and in HIV um, and how that might play out. There, is, there are molecules or inhibitors. Uh, 78C is actually a cancer drug that's used to treat multiple myeloma. So to remind people, CD38 is not only a marker for T cell maturation, but it also appears in the terminally differentiated B cell plasma cells. So it's also an important target for uh, multiple myeloma and cancer. So there are a whole range of these cancer drugs that have been tested, and this is a, a, a summary of a paper where they use this inhibitor in a mouse model to show to reverse age-related NAD decline and improve parameters like uh, glucose tolerance, muscle function, exercise capacity, and cardiac function. So all of these molecules now have been used, and those of you who may be aware, Eric Verdon, the president of the Buck Institute, is actually has a whole program now looking at small molecule inhibitors of CD38 and targeting those for aging, and I hope eventually thinking about those in the context of HIV. So some of our initial work was to look at alterations in NAD levels in HIV patients. Now these are stratified by cardiovascular risk. These are the same patients I showed you earlier uh, that we studied the tryptophan catabolic pathways. And interestingly enough, in those patients which have high interval median thickness, which is a surrogate marker for cardiovascular disease, they have the lowest amounts of NAD and NADH pathways. So again, high predictability for IMT, they're going to have low NAD, uh, and they also have high IDO as well. So these are the same people we've looked at. And we can show then the HIVs with low IMT or the healthy individuals have higher levels. We then went back and looked at CD38 correlation in those patients and NAD levels. And interestingly enough, we do find elevated CD38 expression, but not on T cells. It's on the monocytes. So critically now, it's a different cell. It's the innate cell that we've been now studying so much in HIV and aging that may be very important in driving the reduction of NAD levels so that the percent 38 on total monocytes does correlate highly then with an inverse correlation with NAD plasma levels. We've then gone on and look in our, our same diabetic patients and find that those with diabetes mellitus also have significant elevations. And again, these are small studies. We're now expanding these more uh, with other uh, cohorts of diabetes patients with and without therapy. So these are all HIV individuals with diabetes, with diabetes on therapy and no diabetes and can find, again, the, the lower levels of NAD in the diabetes patients that may be critical for their outcome. And then just to remind people, in this uh, Doug Seals article from Nature from a few years ago, that we have used NAD therapeutically, and there are at least 30 trials. If you go on clinicaltrials.gov, there are 30 trials now involved in restoring uh, NAD in a variety of manners. So I think, again, you have various ways of thinking about this and supplementation approaches that we've talked about in terms of our elder populations as well as in our aging populations. So in the last few minutes available, I'll talk more about cellular senescence and try to link back more to what we know about aging and senescence. So when we start thinking about senescence, this may be very different than when we think about immune senescence. So the fields of HIV and aging still are not necessarily completely linked, and they do talk different languages. So that in the aging field, when we talk about senescence, which is linked to DNA damage, telomere dysfunction or mitochondrial defects is that this is associated with a senescence associated secretory phenotype or SASP. And most of the work looking at SASP is not linked to the immune cells, but looking at tissue cells. 
And the same pro-inflammatory mediators are being looked at like IL-6, MCP-1, IL-8, and so on, or IP-10. But these are not the cells that are making the SASP are those of endothelial cells, epithelial cells, and importantly, adipocytes. So we're now studying this and the important interaction between HIV aging is where we're studying adipocytes and doing fat biopsy studies, both in our patient populations with HIV and in our primate models to try to look further at the SAS phenotype. And we do know that there are other biomarkers of this aging phenotype uh, that Judith Campisi first published on, including the senescence associated beta galactosidase activity. And many people, including Patricia Fitzgerald Bacarsley, have adapted these to flow based assays. So you can actually measure these on flow cytometric assays and then also measure P16 and P21 expression, which are also markers of this SAS phenotype. So, again, as I said, the senescent cells accumulate with aging mostly in tissues. So we now are thinking about what about inhibitors? So these can be both SASP inhibitors or senolytics. Now again, senolytics are those that target the senescent cells to kill them. And when we think about the SASP inhibitors, we're thinking about the JAK or mTOR. So the same pathways I just showed you. Those are the same inhibitors that were involved in therapeutics that we're thinking about in aging, in HIV, and potentially in the context of COVID. And then on the senolytic side, uh, the dizatinib and quercetin molecules have been used. And then also uh, ABT-263, which is a cancer drug that's also been used as a senolytic. And then FOXO4 has also been looked at, and, fis and fisetin. So what we know is, and I'll just skip through those slides quickly, is that there are different modes of action, different ways of approaching this. But we're now thinking about both of these pathways in the context of both HIV and aging, both with SASP inhibitors and senolytics. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, metformin being an important drug that is associated with changes in the gut microbiome. And this was a, the LILAC study. And the reason why uh, Jean-Pierre Routy uh, named this the, the LILAC study is that metformin is extracted from French lilac, so aptly named. It's an anti-diabetic anti drug, as you'll recall, uh, anti-inflammatory in models, increases CD4 counts uh, in diabetic patients with ART, and anti-aging in models. So again, gives you a good opportunity. And I'll just show you some of the initial work from Jean-Pierre's uh, study. Um, he presented this first at our microbiome meeting, so he kindly provided me some slides. And then also at the last uh, CROI meeting, some additional data was presented at virtual CROI. But interestingly enough, in a small study, uh, over a very short time, metformin tended to increase uh, bacterial diversity in stool. So again, I told you you have a loss of diversity in HIV patients and that metformin did have an effect of increasing at least the Shannon index and not quite uh, significant changes as well in the, in the Simpson index as well. But interestingly, there were some changes in soluble 14 that was detected after metformin discontinuation. So again, maybe some effects on inflammation. Further work needs to be done. And as I said, there's a large study starting with clinical endpoints in the, uh, sponsored by AFAR on metformin in the aging in, in the TAME trial. And we've also had additional discussions uh, within the ACTG to think about this as a next big study in our ACTG trials with metformin. So overall, microbiota composition was stable but it's slightly changing gut bacterial microbiota, um, slightly changed also the fungal microbiome. And again, there needs to be larger studies with longer time periods, which are what we're undertaking, hopefully in the near future in our HIV patients. I also mentioned the role of rapamycin or serolimus, another drug that's used in our transplant patients, inhibits cytokine dependent signaling, and it does interfere with T cell receptor signaling as well. And this is data from Tim Heinrich's ACTG study uh, that I'm showing you here, and that there were significant changes in both the CCR5 expression in the rapamycin trial here, and also reductions in KI67 and PD-1. So some very significant differences seen in terms of rapamycin uh, in a 20-week study. But more importantly, one of the first studies here was to show 
changes in CD4 T cell associated HIV DNA in these uh, individuals. So again, there was an effect, one of the first studies to show a significant impact of a, a drug intervention. Now rapamycin is a SASP inhibitor. It's the same drug that's now going to be used and has been used in aging studies in a number of approaches. And there are a number of companies now making smaller um, analogs of rapamycin to be used in clinical trials in COVID as well. So finally, I mentioned the synolytics. We're also interested in synolytics, which includes the Zatnib and Quercertin, um, and they're preferentially removed senescent cells by targeting their anti-apoptotic pathways. They've been shown to expand lifespan and health span in mice, uh, work by Ming Zhu uh, with Jim Kirkland at, uh, at the Mayo Clinic. Um, they also delay and prevent and multiple age and senescence associated conditions. And so they've also been shown to reduce neuroinflammation. Uh, and they more recently, this is all mainly in animal models, but there have been recent human trials in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We're now collaborating with Adam Spivak's group in Utah to look at this further. And Adam actually has a grant that we're collaborating on, an R34 grant, to take this further in uh, HIV patients to use uh, the dizapnib and quercetin approaches. But this is just some data from Adam to show very nicely that there are some impacts in vitro macrophage infection induces a senescent gene expression that's mitigated. So that you get, if you look down here at the bottom, uh, especially IL-18 uh, and uh, here, which is uh, actually significant in IL-1, are reduced uh, with uh, uh, treatment in, uh, with the zapnib and the macrophages infected with HIV. So you induce a SAS phenotype, IL-18 being part, and IL-1 of that same inflammasome pathway I showed you further that we showed with ELF-2 association in our um, patients with uh, which we study in the gut. So again, some promising opportunities here of thinking about the zapnib, and we're now trying to move this further and thinking about this in our HIV and our aging patients as well. So finally, you can see there are a large number of opportunities to think about these synolytics and synomorphics. This is a nice review uh, that was published by Eric Burden in Nature just a, a last year, showing the role of, again, rapamycin, um, synolytics, NAD precursors we mentioned, the, sir, the sirtuins that can also be used, metformin, exercise, again, a very important area that we not been studied as much, and I know of interest to many folks here in terms of aging, and then finally the potential for caloric restriction. So all of these are potential approaches that can be combined together to think about their role in both aging and HIV, and many of them are also being tested. And then finally, I'll just say that the senescence-associated accelerate aging, there's an important role for HIV and HIV gene products, and I didn't go into a lot of those details, also, the role of the heart, the drugs themselves. Uh, we know there are differences in terms of the integrase inhibitors on weight gain potentially and looking at those. And I think everybody here is very familiar with those. Also, other cofactors I know of interest, things like substance abuse. And then finally, leading to the senescent cells here in terms of looking at cell cycle arrest, oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction. All of these are very common features of aging and HIV. And then finally, it's the SASP that I mentioned that's present both in and potentially in aging and HIV that can lead to accelerated aging. And now this particular gives us many targets that we can go after that I've mentioned today. So I'll just end and thank my collaborators. I mentioned many of them through the talk at the University of Colorado, at UCSF, the University of the West Indies, McGill University, uh, Monash University, uh, at University of Utah, and Ming Zhu University of Connecticut, and thank all the funders. And this was the COVID hospital. This picture you're seeing now on your screen was the COVID hospital for Chicago. Uh, we have screened 15,000 patients as of today. We've actually found 5,000 COVID positives, and we have at any one time for the last month over 250 patients hospitalized at Rush with 70 of them on ventilators. So this hospital was actually built and was built right after um, the 9-11 and was built to actually deal with containment, was also the hospital during the Ebola crisis for people to come to. Luckily, we had none, but we really did a lot to help the Chicago 
and the community in large during the uh, current pandemic of COVID-19. I'll end here and be happy to answer any questions uh, related to this talk or other work we're doing to intersect with COVID-19. Thank you. Okay, um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, so this talk is open for questions. <clears throat> Hi, um, if I may. Yes, I'll go ahead. Um, beautiful talk, Dr. Lande. Um, I have a I have a quick question. Two two quick questions, which are both related. One is um, you mentioned about um, associations between microbial dysbiosis and NAD levels. I was wondering if fecal microbi microbial uh, transplantation would be a potential strategy to bring it down. Like you you mentioned about all these drugs, like met metformin and all that. And a second, related, a second question related to that is, if you were to name one bacteria or a few bacteria, which uh, are potentially like highest producers of IDO, if there are any, what would they be? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. And maybe, um, I know Monty is on, or if he's still on, could maybe comment about fecal transplant and NAD. I, I, we haven't thought about that. And it might be interesting to see if, if how much the microbiome would drive that. That's an interesting question. Um, we, uh, yeah, I think um, I would say uh, Ivan Vukovic was really the first one, and he had the science translational medicine paper with um, Mike McCune. I might refer you back to that paper because he probably, and I don't remember the, the details. It's been a while since I've read the paper, so it's about four or five years, but it was, a, it was actually the first of the publications of HIV and microbiome, and he did show an association of IDO loss with uh, bacteria. And I don't remember, and they're probably in that or a number of the bacteria, and I'm sure it's not just one, but there may be several, so I can't give you the name, but I might refer you back to that original paper. We are doing more work now, um, and in the same vein, trying to understand what particular bacteria. So within the Ys and the Max cohorts, we're uh, now doing sequencing uh, of about a thousand people to try to get more involved um, in this in this area uh, to think about. Uh, and Rob Knight is actually our collaborator on these microbiome studies. So I hope in you know probably our next paper try to drill a little bit deeper. Um, what's really stopped a lot of this work has been the COVID nineteen pandemic has gotten us away from a lot of this focus. Looking forward. Thank you so much. I don't know, Monty. Are you still there? Do you have any thoughts about fecal transplants and NAD? may have left. Hi, can I ask a question? Sure, Jules. Hi, Alan. So um, I'm sure you, you and many others know that the preliminary reporting is, and I just recently spoke to a, a very large clinic director here in New York, an uh, HIV clinic, uh, who has many patients with HIV who got COVID, and we're hearing these reports from around the world and none of his patients are doing any poorly. In fact, they appear to be even doing better maybe than the general HIV negative population who get COVID. And of course, one of the common explanations is that the inflammatory storm may be suppressed in people with HIV. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Uh, that's a great question, Jules. I'd, I'd love to know that data because I haven't seen any publications on HIV and COVID. I think that's a, a great question because uh, it's going to certainly impact a lot of how we study HIV in the future. Um, it, again, we think we know the drugs they're on, although the, the clinical trials haven't borne out that the, the HIV drugs have a more significant impact on COVID-19 in the non-HIV population. But I, I guess that's an important question to see, are the cytokine levels or are some of the other regulatory levels altered enough in our HIV populations that don't allow for as a significant a storm? I'm wondering, are all these older people as well? And do they, if, is it also, do they have the same underlying conditions, which would be even more intriguing if they have diabetes or cardiovascular disease and aren't seeing as a significant uh, COVID uh, disease. And I would agree, those are the real things I'd want to look at is all these pathways I've alluded to today on inflammation and also looking at SAS and inflammasome pathways. And I'd love to be able to also look to see, do
do they have higher or lower markers of microbial translocation and thinking about the gut microbiome pathways as well. I think, I think that's a great question and one we really need to answer. I would hope, has that physician collected samples on his patient, Jules? Because I think any of us would love to look at those and answer those questions directly. I mean, that's a great question. I don't know the answer, but um, uh, he's the head of HIV at Mount Sinai. Uh, he's very well known here in New York, for sure. And I was on the phone with him yesterday, and he told me many of his patients, HIV positive, have, have gotten COVID. And he told me only one had to be hospitalized that's, to get a ventilator, and everyone recovered at home. That's phenomenal. That is phenomenal. And, and given the fact that probably many of these do have risks of cardiovascular, metabolic, neurocognitive, others right. outcomes that would put them in those higher risks for COVID infection and bad outcomes. I think it's, that is a tremendous question. I don't know, others may want to comment, but I think that's a critical question all of us are asking. And I think it's the same sort of gestalt I've been hearing from others that people aren't doing worse with HIV and COVID, but maybe even doing better. I have a question. I mean, it's, it's always, we, we all ask the chicken and the egg story. What, whose factors in aging drives the changes in the gut microbiome? And, you know, by re restoring the gut microbiome, you still have the, the pressure of the host factors that is going to alter the, I mean, keep, keep maintaining. So you cannot sustain that particular biome despite the changes you make. Sure, I, I, it, it's it, it's certainly going to be micro, you know, it's going to be multifactorial. I, I talk about the gut microbiome. I could have given a, a talk about uh, CMV. I could have been talking about other inflammatory factors. So um, I think it's all all of the above. And the only way we can get to any sense of of cause and effect or mechanism, as you said, chicken or egg, is by interventional trials. And as I as I said. All of our approaches, rifaximin, sevalimir, mesalamine, uh, our probiotic VSL3, we have seen not much effects in HIV, although, you know, that's the question of, are, do we, have we targeted the right approach? And do we need to do this, like in other approaches in HIV, more multifactorial? We did look and do find, uh, you know, CMV is there in the gut. And, you know, CMV is a culprit of senescence. And with Sarah Gianella Weibel, we did show that CMV was another driver in the gut for microbiome changes. Um, we are starting the Latermavir study and the vaccine study with uh, City of Hope in our ACTG trials. These are all gonna be older individuals and we will get cardiovascular measures um, and we will be able to look at adipose tissue. The other point of aging where a lot of inflammation happens, it may be in adipose tissue, as you know, we all, you know, there is that weight gain and increase in adiposity. And so that may be another critical site we've kind of lost sight of for inflammation. Um, let me just make another comment is if you look at who, ha where are ACE2 receptor expression, the highest level, at least in, in one published study, is actually adipocytes have the highest level of ACE2 receptor expression. Um, now, I don't know if anybody's looked at COVID in, in fat or whether or not there is COVID there. I can tell you, working with John Curta, there is a huge amount of CMV, and we're now looking at that further in adipose tissue, and you get immune cells in there. And so as part of our Latermavir trial, we have a funded sub-study to look at that further. So I think all these are great questions. I think it's multifactorial. I, I think only by these interventional trials, and I think it's going to take more certainly than one intervention to try to keep things and restore back health and hopefully uh, health span. So we have many people here, or at least people here, who are working on adipose tissue and the glycome and things like that. And I'm just wondering if anybody has any questions. We have the wise people, uh, especially the adipose tissue and, and the metabolic studies uh, they're really ongoing, and, but everyone's too shy to ask you questions. Okay. I'll come back and meet with them in person sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what you need to do. So, um, if anybody else, any questions? Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. So, if uh, if I may, um, very nice talk, Dr. Lende. Um, I I would like to know um, if you have any um, more information or if you want to add anything regarding the glycom and the glycosylation of the antibodies. I mean, um, could I know that the glycosylation is really really important for the ADCC. So I was wondering if that can explain why we always see like a reduced uh, vaccine response, for example, to influenza in uh, elderly individuals compared to the young one. I mean, if the, the big ground status of the glycom can actually be one of the reasons. Sure. It's certainly something that has been thought about and looked at in some papers. It's, it's kind of where we're heading right now, looking at the antibody glycome. Um, as I mentioned in the COVID patients, because I think that's going to be a critical question of alterations. We know in HIV, I showed you, you get hyposylation of the IgG glycome in HIV patients. So a lot of that may influence um, in our patients what happens over time and um, how that gets restored back. And we are in our the, a grant we've just started getting fun, get funding from NIDDK is to try to treat monkeys and then look at all those parameters by restoring back fucose levels and uh, sialic acid levels in our um, in the monkeys to try to look at those but I think those are critical questions that still need to be answered in both um, in aging vaccine responses and others and I think those may may dictate a lot of the functional activity for antibodies as you point out in influenza responses that haven't been but maybe there's folks to meet if you have folks there doing glycome work maybe you or others have looked at the glycome already in the patients yeah. since you do a lot of flu vaccine work. Yes. Well, Stefano, who was asking you the question, is actually doing some things. Okay. Uh, uh, hi. Uh, uh, may I uh, ask a question? Yeah. So that will be the, probably the last question. So please, is that Barry? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Barry. Uh, so first, I want to say that uh, your work is uh, absolutely superb, and uh, and your uh, talk was uh, chock full of uh, of, of potential uh, ideas. Uh, so so uh, it was really exciting to listen to. Uh, the the uh, thing that caught my eye in this past week, in related to COVID and the hyperinflammation is the uh, elevation in ferritin levels. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as you know, I'm sure uh, iron levels uh, are relevant for um, uh, in infection immune-related responses, but uh, also are important in metabolic regulation. Uh, has your work... Uh, focused on, uh, on a, anything related to this? Not at the moment, uh, but certainly may take me there. I think those are great questions to be looked at in those pathways. Like you say, all these acute phase, the ferritins, the CRPs, the D-dimers. Um, one of the people who I was talking to recently who may have thought about it more, although I don't know that he has, is Rush Tracy, some of you may know from the University of Vermont, who's really a superb uh, person in the coagulation and, and hematologic area. So I think we're, you know, these are kind of pathways we need to look at. And I, yeah, I, I haven't gotten there yet in terms of ferritin, but it, it does raise some interesting questions to think about in our metabolic outcome data and related or not related to COVID, I think would be definitely worth pursuing. The, the linkage uh, from uh, pro-inflammatory status uh, uh, with ferritin um, may lead to uh, elevated oxidative stress and and uh, damage to uh, and cellular damage as a consequence. So I'm particularly interested in the vascular endothelium. Yeah, I think those are great questions there. As you know, and it may be best, I, I can also refer Savita to another collaborator who I know you know, Jay Rappaport. Jay is uh, part of the active group with um, on the preclinical development team with um, Francis Collins at NIH on their rapid response. But I know he has set up and done infections with COVID-19 in the animals, both older and younger animals at uh, Tulane Primate Center. And I think that could be a, a wonderful 
opportunity, Barry, and maybe Savita could connect, you know, or I could, I know Savita knows Jay, uh, who runs the facility and we were just chatting on a call the other day uh, to try to look at some of these in the animal models. And I know the African green monkeys, as well as the pigtails and the rhesus are all models where one could de do a deeper dive on some of the questions you're asking. And there's just a huge interest now in, in the NHP and, and that model system, uh, as well as making more animals available from the African green colony. I actually chair the advisory panel for the Wake Forest African green monkey colony. And we were having that discussion this week about that model in COVID. Thank you. What do you think about studying it in aging monkeys? Yes, uh, Jay has done that with some of his okay. old, exactly. Okay. So that's, he's, he's infected some older monkeys. I haven't seen the data he was just describing. I have to get him to get more of that data, but he's gonna be doing a lot more work on that. And we were discussing that this week. Okay. I think I have some of the data. Hi, Alan. Uh, oh, you have data, okay, yeah. No, that's Francois. And I, we've been talking to Jay and uh, I dropped some uh, African greens up there. <laughs> so. Well, I was just going to say, I, I know Francois, you probably have data, so. <laughs> I don't have a BSL-3, so I ah. depend on Jay. So. But yeah, one of the African greens, uh, the older ones basically keeled over at day 20, nothing to be seen, day 21, hunched in the cage. So they had this mm -hmm. And then they did some others, I think, with... Um, uh, aerosolized infection and again it's only it's not consistent across all the animals uh, but one sort of uh, had the same outcome on day eight instead of uh, later on. Uh, okay. So what are your thoughts Francois as the models? What are you, you're, you're a monkey guy. What do you think? Uh, about well you know I mean the biggest question we have I think Jay and his team is probably one that really went for uh, pathogenesis. Uh, everybody else is pushing to test vaccines. I've got six vaccines that people want to test. <laughs> that yeah. We want to, so, we want to, uh, you know, challenge there. So you do see viral loads and and rhesus and and um, um, and certainly in, in African greens as well. They might be a little more sensitive. I think the uh, we still don't know about the sinos. We dropped some of these out there also to for them to look at. Mm -hmm. We don't have the data yet. So it's well, there's huge demand, as you know, and that's what we were. Yeah. I was talking to uh, Matt Jorgensen about on our call this week. So yeah, the new world, the new world monkeys though have been disappointing. Apparently, there's nothing. Uh, I think that came out of Kaoroka's lab. That's yes. Awesome. Right. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Enjoyed your talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, that was great. Thank you so much, uh, everyone who has attended.